Hello fellow gamers, I'm Christopher Christman of Retro Game Network, and coming up next, a recap of last week's retro video game news on the RGN Files for the week ending Saturday, July 21, 2018. In the RGN Files this week, Sega has officially released their expanded edition of last year's Sonic Mania to modern gaming platforms this past Tuesday. Now known as Sonic Mania Plus, the game follows Sonic the Hedgehog alongside of his loyal companions Tails and Knuckles as they venture to defeat Dr. Eggman and his robotic henchmen. The game pays homage to the original Sega Genesis Sonic games of the 90s, featuring fast-paced action-based gameplay and a side-scrolling platformer similar to the original titles of the franchise. The updated version offers new features Features, including Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel being added as playable characters. This is the first game that Mighty returns since Knuckles Chaotix in 1995, while this is the first 2D side-scroller Sonic game that Ray makes an appearance in. In addition, the title is now being offered on physical media for the very first time. While a so-called physical edition was released this last August, the game itself was only a download code and not actual game media. Sonic Mania Plus is available for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch platforms for just under $30 for disc or cartridge media or via digital download. Those that are interested in the game that purchased the digital version last year can buy the updated content for a reduced cost of just under $5. Other news in regards to modern games of classic franchises comes to us from Llamasoft this week, as the company has finally released their anticipated Tempest 4000 to modern game platforms. The game, which is a retooling of the classic Tempest arcade title of the early 1980s, has been in production over the past year and was developed by Llamasoft founder Jeff Minter. Minter is the man responsible for another port of the classic coin-op game, as he helped bring Tempest 2000 to the Atari Jaguar and Sega Saturn consoles during the mid-1990s. The release dates for this game game had varied repeatedly over the course of the past few months, with its original announcement being done in August of last year, and was first expected to be released this past March. While the game was actually available as a download for a few hours on various marketplaces, the game was very quickly removed from all servers. The game was later slated to be released sometime during the quote summer of 2018, with a more specific date of July 12 eventually being announced. The game was finally released to the public this past Tuesday. Consumers can purchase the game for the PS4 and Xbox One platforms for just under $30 on digital or physical media, or for Windows-based computers using the Steam network for just under $20. This past week, Retro Game Network published three unique articles in regards to emulation and Nintendo. Leading our reports was the discovery of a fully functional NES emulator that was found within the program code of the 2001 GameCube title Animal Crossing, 17 years after its initial release. While the game by default offered a variety of NES games that could be found during the actual gameplay, there was also a generic NES console found within that did not feature any built-in games which you could buy from Red or obtain through random events. The system was assumed to be just a placeholder or possibly for decorative purposes only. However, recently, security researcher James Chambers made the discovery that the emulation program could actually be used to play ROM images that are stored on memory cards that are plugged into the console. Loading up the generic NES console inside Animal Crossing that did not have a game attached to it would cause the game to search for any compatible ROM images that were found on plugged-in memory cards, which was done with programmed commands within the source code. Using a variety of methods, Chambers has been successful in loading software into the game that was not natively programmed into the title, such as Pinball and Mega Man. Chambers has fully documented the entire process that was done to make this exploit possible. While our next story is not necessarily new news, it was only recently been making its way around the retro video game community. A somewhat new emulator program called VB Gin has been released that allows retro gamers to play Nintendo Virtual Boy video games on the Oculus Rift virtual reality headset. Unlike VR systems of today, the Virtual Boy did not offer motion-based controller input or head motion ability, however did allow the use of XY input access to offer fluid movements, which was still somewhat new at the time. In development for over five years, the VB Gin project is the creation of Jay Mattis, founder of independent video game developer High Horse Entertainment. The emulator offers two unique play modes, one where the display is fixed and does not move in unison with head movements, and the other mode offering the emulator to function independently in a more true virtual reality setting, which will allow you to move closer or further away from the game's output. You can also change the color of the output from the standard red-black color scheme to a gray-black color palette, allowing gameplay that is supposedly easier on the eyes. The VBGN emulator program for Oculus Rift is currently available as a free download in which the executable as well as the source code have been made available to the public. 
In legal news, Nintendo has recently filed a lawsuit against the supposed operator of two popular ROM image distribution websites. Jacob Mathias and his Arizona company, Mathias Designs LLC, allegedly operate LoveRoms.com and LoveRetro.co, which provide downloads to multiple collections of ROM images, including those made for Nintendo consoles. In a complaint filed at an Arizona federal court this week, Nintendo has sued Mathias for copyright and trademark infringement, alongside of distributing proprietary BIOS software while using trademarked logos and characters within the websites. The company is aiming to have both of the websites shut down, as well as transfer the ownership of the domain names and subdomains to Nintendo. In addition, the Big N has also expressed a desire to force the present operator of the websites to reveal their original sources for the infringing ROM images. They are also seeking financial compensation for supposedly alleged damages, requesting $150,000 per infringing Nintendo title and up to $2 million for each trademark infringement. With over 140 copyrighted titles and 40 trademarks currently on record, damages could possibly go well over the $100 million mark. As of the record date of this podcast, the defendants in this case have not commented publicly on any aspects in regards to these current legal proceedings. Coming up next, the personal viewpoint of one of this week's featured stories with our Wimho, well, in my humble opinion, commentary. There's been a lot of interesting news this week about Nintendo and emulation, and it was a little bit difficult for me to decide on which story that I would casually talk about on our podcast. While I was originally planning to discuss a little bit about what I thought about Nintendo's intentions with the NES emulator program that was found in the GameCube edition of Animal Crossing back in 2001, the fact of the matter is is that the weekend notification of the recent lawsuit between Nintendo and two ROM image hosting websites is too important to not talk about. Anyone that's ever played a video game ROM image by means of use of an emulator has always been told about the legalities of playing video games using such a method. For as long as emulation software has been made available to the public, the questions and uncertainty of the copyright laws have been confusing many times. This week, our question is simple. Is Nintendo asking for too much financial compensation when it comes to the monetary value that they are placing on their intellectual properties? Well, in my humble opinion, it's all a matter of mathematics and a little bit of arithmetic. Let's take a look at the games on their own for our first example. Nintendo is suing for $150,000 for each ROM image that has been made available for distribution through the websites. Let's take a look at what the cost would be on games that are still available for purchase from Nintendo directly via their virtual console or other services. Now, with each game that the virtual console offers costing $5 per download, that would mean that they're asking for compensation of about 30,000 downloads. Now, of course, the major monetary request is coming from the trademark infringement at the request of $2 million each, which could lead into the nine-digit mark by the time all is said and done, and that's just for using the likeness of the company in one shape or another multiple times throughout the website. Now, it goes without saying that the laws for using ROM images can be confusing. Many of us, like myself, that grew up using emulation methods in the mid-1990s were always told that as long as we owned the original cartridge, we could legally own a copy of the ROM image. Then later on, we were also told that we were allowed to possess a ROM image for 24 hours as a way of, quote, trying before buying, end quote. But neither of these laws have ever been documented necessarily as true. When the companies added the international laws into the mix, saying that it all depended on where you lived, that just made it even more confusing. Now again, this was also a law that was never confirmed. It kind of makes you wonder if any ROM images are technically legal if they contain commercial games on them, and if emulators are only legal if you are developing your own titles. Of course, for this case, we are not talking about ownership of the actual game titles by the user, but rather the distribution of the copyrighted ROM images on a public forum. However, my issue with the strictness of ROM image distribution is that in some cases, these games could very easily become extinct and lost forever as the decades continue to go on. Physical media, while very reliable, will eventually deteriorate to the point of no recovery. While this is more so for games published on floppy disks and other magnetic media for computers of the era, the same deterioration happens with cartridge media as well. There have been some situations in which games for vintage systems, like the Atari 2600, literally have only one single copy of a cartridge still in existence, and it's thanks to the appreciation of the owner of the cartridge that the game has not been lost forever by doing ROM image dumping. Now, of course, in many cases, the companies that produce games like this have been long out of business for several decades, and Nintendo is still a very strong contender in the world of video games. So I can understand why Nintendo gets pretty pissed when they find out that ROM images are being offered at no cost, especially when the games are still being offered for sale by Nintendo in one form or another. But the problem is this. Even if the sites in question 
stations do get shut down. It will not be the last time that you'll be able to download the images from an internet source. Even if these two sites were to be forfeited to Nintendo, I can already choose from dozens of other sites that do exactly the same thing. The point that I'm trying to make is that this is going to be a situation that survives as long as Nintendo survives. While I can see Nintendo profiting on suing torrent sites and server owners that do these illegal activities, there will eventually be a time when owning these games on every console produced will no longer be considered desirable. After all, how many times does somebody really want to pay for Super Mario Brothers every time a brand new Nintendo system comes out? Not so much in my personal standard. Now, before I end this commentary, I want to remind our readers that I consider myself to be a console purist, and I very rarely use emulation software because I personally don't feel that it gives us the same experience. But we would love to hear from fellow gamers that prefer emulation methods, and we'd like to get the discussion started from those that prefer that way of playing games from our past. In conclusion, video game piracy has always been a problem. It will always be a problem. But the point of piracy versus greed versus preservation is something that needs to be thought about by all parties of retro gamers, both on the consumer side and corporate side, before our favorite hobby is lost to the land of time. However, in the meantime, let the record show, don't copy that floppy. And that is my humble opinion. Last week on our social media outlets, we gave our readers a brief update about some of the stories that we focused on previously. In continuation of these stories, we would like to inform our viewers that the full-color deluxe edition of the Atari 2600 Homebrew Companion, written by Brian Mathern, is now officially available for purchase on Amazon for a cost of just under $31. In addition, the pre-order window for the Nintendo Switch port of the 25th anniversary edition of Night Trap has officially ended, with limited run games stating that the games will be shipped out sometime this September. And finally this week, we at Retro Game Network wanted to remind our fellow readers about our next official Twitch stream, which is slated to take place on Tuesday, July 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We are pretty sure that we have gotten our audio issues fixed and resolved finally, and we will be broadcasting a playthrough of the PlayStation 4 version of the full motion video game The Bunker, where this contributor will attempt to collect all trophies, specifically ones that were missed during an original play of the game. We hope that you will join us for the fun later this week, as we try to finally get our regularly scheduled Twitch streams up and running on a normal basis. We thank you for your continued support and hope that you will tune in this Tuesday night. That's it for this week's edition of the RGN Files. For those listening on BGM on FM, please stay tuned. There'll be more video game music coming up shortly. For complete details of any of this week's stories, visit RetroGameNetwork.com. And don't forget to follow us on our social media outlets, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at RetroGame Network, and on Twitter and Twitch at RetroGameNet. For the RGN Files, I'm Christopher Chrisman. This week's news stories provided by the following. ComicBook.com, Digital Trends, Hardcore Gamer, IGN, Nintendo Life, Torrent Freak, Venture Beat. The opinions expressed within our Wimho commentary segment are not necessarily those of all contributors or affiliates of Retro Game Network.